You're listening to the Hog Sports Network Daily Podcast. Now, here's your host, Matt Jones. Hey, happy Wednesday to you. Appreciate you being with us. A little bit later, Christina Long will be in studio with me as we look forward to Arkansas and Mississippi State football. But first, we're going to talk some basketball with Greg Gurley. He is the color analyst for the Kansas Jayhawk radio basketball broadcast. Arkansas and Kansas obviously playing an exhibition game Friday night at Bud Walton Arena, 8 o'clock tip-off. It's going to be on SEC Network. A little bit bigger uh, exhibition game than you typically see. Greg, we appreciate you being here. Oh, thanks for having me. Hey, so, I mean, just tell us, what's the uh, the feeling up there in Lawrence about this game? You know, I, I, we're excited. You know, I, I knew that it was coming uh, for a while, talking to Bill about it, him and Cal had gotten together. Last year we did a similar game in, in Illinois. Mm-hmm. We went to Champaign and played, uh, you know, Brad Underwood and, and Bill are buddies, and it was a, a, a fundraiser for Maui after the wildfires over there. And then this game, they just say, hey, it would be cool to have a, a, an exhibition game, doesn't count, try some new things, and let's raise a lot of money while we're at it. And that's exactly what, what we're doing in, in, a, in a big arena. You guys sell it out and, and, and two, uh, two big-time programs. And really, uh, I, I'm excited about it. I know our team and our coaches are just because kind of, you know, when you practice all summer and early fall, you don't really know what you have yet because you're playing against your guys. It's fun to go up against somebody else and, and figure out, you know, where you're at. You mentioned that game at Illinois last year. I watched that one. Uh, it was the day after Arkansas played Purdue here in Fayetteville. Uh, there was a big Michigan State-Tennessee exhibition game that same weekend. Why do you think it is that coaches are, are – it seems like they're more open now to playing these types of games out in the public – I remember KU a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, they played Illinois in a closed-door scrimmage over at Lindenwood in St. Charles. So it just seems like coaches are, are more willing to play these things out in public now. Well, you, you look at it, your, our exhibition games used to be you play a couple of directional schools or someone in your state, and really you don't get a whole lot out of it. You know, you, you beat somebody by 40, you, you play all your, your bench guys, and when you play in Arkansas or in Illinois, it's a real atmosphere in, in, the, in the day and age of the transfer portal where you got new guys all over the place and they're coming from uh, possibly losing programs and you want to see how they react under the lights. Like tomorrow, or Friday night will be interesting because we got a lot of guys that are from all over the place and mm-hmm. this will be their first real look at a big time atmosphere, pressure situation, even though the pressure is not there as far as a win or a loss goes in the record books, but coaches want to see that. They want to see how guys react. They, you know, they always say when they recruit kids, they want to see them when they're pretty good. They want to see them when they're really good. And they want to see them when they're bad Mm -hmm. because they want to see how they react. And hopefully things don't go our way for the whole game. Hopefully we find out something about some of our guys that we just don't know much yet. John Calipari has already said that Arkansas is going to be without multiple players for this game. He didn't say who, but, you know, based on the the open scrimmages they did earlier this month, maybe Jonas Adu, maybe John L. Davis, maybe uh, Adu Thierro won't be able to play in this. I wonder how is KU from a health standpoint? We're going to be in a similar boat. There's a couple guys with some nagging stuff that, you know, probably won't play. I uh, haven't named any names yet, but there'll be a couple guys that, you know, when a game like this, doesn't count like if this game counted the two or three guys that won't play might have played Mm -hmm. and I'm assuming that's the same with Arkansas so it'll give an opportunity for Arkansas to have two or three guys that will play that wouldn't normally play and same with us so uh you gotta you gotta turn a negative into a positive and see how they react John or Calipari, he said at uh, SEC Media Days last week, he said that that neither he nor Bill Self would would ever put a, a player's you know long term health on the line for an exhibition like this. You've seen these two coach games against each other. Uh, they've they've gone. I think this is the thirteenth time. Uh, Twelve of them have counted. Obviously, there have been some really big games, national championship games uh, between KU and, and Coach Cal's team, whether it be Memphis or Kentucky. I wonder. I'm, I'm sure you've heard Bill Self speak about coaching against John Calipari. Just, just what do you? What, what's the relationship between these two? Well, you know, they were together here in Lawrence years ago when, when they were under Larry Brown's staff, and so mm-hmm. 
the relationship goes back many, many years. And, uh, you know, they're at the top of their game right now. You know, they recruit the best players. They get the best players. They're fighting over the same guys. I always give John Calipari a ton of credit for that he, he's able to recruit the elites and still get them to play hard. That's what makes Bill and Cal so good is that they get so many guys and everybody worries about, well, they got too many guys. How are they going to manage the Mets? How are they going to get them to play hard? But they both have an uncanny ability to get guys to play hard and convince them that the pie is big enough for everyone to get a slice, not to be cliche time, but winning is fun. You know, playing in the Champions Classic is fun. Mm-hmm. Playing all the big time games that a John Calipari or a Bill Self affords you to go play is fun. And you really get a great measure of what you have. And, and that's what I think both of those guys have done such an amazing job over a long, long period of time. And there's, there's guys that have come and gone, but really, I mean, with, with no Roy Williams, with no Jay Wright, no Mike Krzyzewski, now Tony Bennett. I mean, not that John Calipari and Bill Self weren't at the top. They're at the top. I mean, they're they're the two elite guys, and that's what makes it so cool that we're getting to tip it off here on Friday. You played for Roy Williams at KU. What what was that experience like? Oh, he's great. You know, it, it's you know, you look back at how he got this job. You know, people forget that in 1988, Kansas won the national title, and then they went on probation. They're the first team ever to to win a national title and not have the chance to go back to the NCAA tournament the next year. And there was a couple of guys that said no to Kansas. I know that sounds crazy to a lot of people that two big time coaches turned Kansas down. So Roy Williams was the third option mm-hmm. and he wasn't a household name. Mm-hmm. Now you say that, but in 1988, he was the second assistant at North Carolina. No one in Kansas knew him. That wouldn't happen nowadays. If, if, you know, if Arkansas would have hired the second assistant at UCLA, would you have been happy? Probably not. <laughs> I mean, that, but back then, that's how it worked. And we caught, you know, lighting in a bottle. He had us in the national championship game three years in his third year. Think about that. So playing for him was, was awesome. I'm from Kansas City, 40 minutes down the road. You know, you get offered a scholarship, a top five program, you take it. Great experience, uh, you know, being around Roy Williams for my years and then being around Bill Self as a broadcaster. I've been unbelievably fortunate to work and play for two of the best ever. So uh, he's an icon here. And, and no, none of us thought that whoever we hired after Coach Williams left, that we were going to be better. But we are. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, the trade, if you call it a trade, where – Coach Williams went to North Carolina and we got Bill Self is the greatest trade ever because three national titles in North Carolina, two national titles at Kansas, perennial one seed in the NCAA tournament. We have a chance every year. It just doesn't happen like that every year. Arkansas and Kansas both just, just a great line of, of coaches. I mean, Calipari now, you know, the third Hall of Fame coach at Arkansas. He mentioned the other day that he's hoping to get Nolan Richardson and Larry Brown and Ted Owens all at the game Friday night. He's not sure if he'll be able to, but he said he would love to have all of them there at midcourt uh, watching this and just kind of being able to see, hey, you you helped create this. Well, and I know that Coach Cal Perry, he, he loves Ted Owens. Uh, whenever I'm around Coach Cal, he always asks about Coach Owens. I never played for Coach Owens, but he's a dear friend. And, and I mean, he's 92, 93 years old. And we go on golf trips with him all the time. He's amazing. So hmm. hopefully uh, – Ted can get to Lawrence several times this year and to uh, Fayetteville as well. You know, Kansas, uh, I want to ask you a little bit about their players. You obviously got what are kind of being referred to as the big three back. You've got Hunter Dickinson and K.J. Adams, uh, Dewan Harris. I want to start with Dickinson, picked the other day to be preseason AP All-American. We know he's very good, but, you know, I I watched a lot of their games last year, and it it seems like there's still a lot of untapped potential there with him. There really is, and I think he's – you know, I say he struggled last year, but he averaged 18 and 11. Mm. Uh, but the guys around him, we, we got caught in a numbers crunch. We had we had a, some injuries. We had a red shirt that could have played. We had a, a guy that was kicked off the team. And so we just had a very, very short bench. And then we 
had some injuries. And so I say all that in, you know, Hunt is a guy that needs good players around. He's not going to just take a team over because mm-hmm. he'll kill you if you if you don't double him. But last year they doubled him because we didn't have the offensive firepower from the three point line. So if you just singled him, he'd kill you. But when you double him and he's got to pitch it to the corner and we don't shoot 30 percent, then we struggle. And now with what we've added as, as pieces on the perimeter with A.J. Storr and Ryland Griffin and Zeke Mayo, as you're able to spread the floor more, teams are going to have to pick their poison defensively. If we double them, Hunt's one of the best passers in the country. And he still, like I said, his numbers last year were really, really good, and I don't know where we would be without him. But he always just felt like there was more. But it was hard to get it out of him simply because – and I don't want this to come off as we didn't – you know, that, that our team personnel – struggled last year, which they they did at times, but it was a numbers thing more than anything. We just didn't have, now we have numbers. DeWan's going to be better. DeWan's going to be able to sift through the defense and not have to go score because teams would help off to stop his penetration and he'd have to shoot 10 footers as opposed to getting to the rim. Now guys camping out in the corner, you got to make a decision. Rylan Griffin, you know, he excelled at Alabama because Mark Sears penetrated and Ryland got a lot of open looks and shocking statement by a color analyst. When you get open looks, they're <laughs> going to go in more, right? That's right. And so you got Ryland Griffin, Zeke Mayo, AJ store averaged 17 points a game at Wisconsin on a team that doesn't score a lot of points. So we've got firepower. And I think that will only help Hunter, Dewan, and KJ. When you see Harris and Adams back, I know KU, they've, they've had some success keeping players for multiple years, maybe more so than some programs have. But it's still kind of, I don't know if jarring is the word, but it really stands out in this day and age when you've got players who have been around a program for that long like they have. Well, I think what, what Bill does an amazing job of is creating a culture, and that's what Cal's going to do there and what he did at Kentucky and other coaches do that. There's not a lot of them, you know, because everyone kind of jumps and what have you done for me lately, but – You know, we've, in this NIL world and transfer portal world, we've done a good job with both of them. And guys will stay for a a discount, you know, because Allen Fieldhouse is amazing. Where our guys live is McCarthy Hall is the nicest residential hall in the country. We have so many things to offer that I think we've been able to keep guys longer uh, and, you know, Hey, you play in the Champions Classic. You have games like this. You go to Maui. Like, you're on the stage a lot when you play at Kansas, Arkansas, Kentucky, North Carolina, Duke. So I think it's easier for the kind of blue bloods to keep guys. Uh, hey, you're going to have disgruntled guys. I want to play more. My people say I'm better than you guys think I am. Minutes aren't enough. Hey, welcome to <laughs> college basketball in 2024. It's going to happen. And it's happened to us. You know, but the beauty of, a, again, an Arkansas, Kansas, Kentucky, North Carolina, Duke, we can go out and pick like, hey, we need a two guard. And you're probably going to start if you're as good as you think you are. And so that helps a lot. You mentioned some of these transfers. We've seen Ryland Griffin at Alabama, I've seen him up close and personal before. Saw him in the NCAA tournament last year, had a great run uh, leading Alabama to the final four. Uh, the one I'm really interested in, though, and I, I want to hear your thoughts on him, is Zeke Mayo. He's a Lawrence yeah. kid, uh, yeah. grew up there, went off to South Dakota State, two-time all-conference last year, Summit League Player of the Year. Uh, this is a pretty cool story for him being able to come back and, and play for his hometown team. Great story, great kid. I played against his dad in high school, uh, the Mayo family around here. I mean, the basketball royalty in Lawrence. And, and he was a guy that kind of got caught in a numbers game, comes out of high school, and he was good. But when you think about Kansas three years ago, you got Christian Brown, you got Jalen Wilson, you got Ochai Abaji, a team that won a national championship. So it wasn't really in the cards three years ago. And then transfer portal hits. He's got had a great career at South Dakota State, and it's exactly the way the transfer portal should work. Kid gets to come back home. He went essentially, I don't want to call it a minor league team, but he, he, he got better and better and better, and he's, he's a pro. He's, he might be our best player. I mean, he plays what, what's so great about Zeke and Shaquille Moore, Hunter Dickinson, and Dewan and KJ. They're all 22, 23 years old. And coaches will always tell you, it's hard to get old and stay old. 
<laughs> and that's what we've been able to do. That's how we won a national championship uh, in 2022 with a lot of old guys. Real quick, uh, what do you think of Arkansas's roster? You know, uh, uh, obviously they're going through what most schools have gone through. It's like you got a brand new roster, and athletes and size, and and, I, and I'm sure Cal's excited about turning the lights on and seeing what they do against a Hunter Dickinson and a KJ because you you go all day in practice, but uh, scores, wings, bigs. I mean, you got everything. It's just a matter of how you mold it all together, and that's. That's the question. That's why you hire a guy like John Calipari to bring in, you know, firepower. And nowadays you have to have it. You, you know, we showed that last year that when you don't have options and you, everyone's going to have injuries. We had injuries and we didn't have the bench to get us where we needed to, to go. Even though, you know, we went 12 and one in the non-con last year with the toughest schedule in the country. And then if you have injuries and you don't have options, it's going to be tough sled in the SEC or the Big 12. Get you out of here on this. Allen Fieldhouse went under underwent a little bit of a renovation over the offseason. What's changed, and, and how does it look different this year? Well, the guts of it are basically the same. Like, like in my lifetime, they'll never knock Allen Fieldhouse down. So we got to continue to put money in a 70-year-old building mm-hmm. to keep it modern. Uh, new scoreboard. Scoreboards in the corners, which we didn't have before. Uh, new floor, paint, lights three or four million dollars on speakers. So the manufactured noise in Allen Fieldhouse is already the loudest arena in the country. Uh, like we had late night the other uh, last Friday and little John, I mean, it, your body would shake from the volume. Hmm. So teams are going to be like, God, it was already loud. And now they can turn it up to 11 or whatever. And so uh, bathrooms, hospitality areas, uh, second and third level concourses, $52 million. Uh, when you come to a game here, you'll see a little bit of it, but a bunch of stuff that had to be done to keep it as the coolest building in the country. So, uh, uh, again, you you wouldn't – it's not just going to jump out at you and be like, oh, this is amazing. It's about the same, but just a little bit better. I don't know. I, I feel like as long as Calipari himself are in these uh, jobs, th- there may be a chance that Arkansas comes up there and plays one day. That would be uh, kind of a cool event. Yeah, because, you know, college basketball, unlike college football, like, you know, someone's going to lose. Yep. And, you know, it happens. It's all about your strength of schedule. And those two guys you just mentioned will play anybody, anytime for the right, you know, con- it's not like we're going to go to Arkansas twice and they come here once. It's going to be an equal deal. But I, I agree, there's there's probably going to be something on the run. Greg, we appreciate your time. Hope you enjoy your uh, visit to Fayetteville and your trip to Herman's. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it and, and uh, hopefully see you at the game on Friday. All right, thank you. Greg Gurley, the color analyst for Kansas basketball. When we come back, Christina Long will be with me, and we'll talk about Arkansas and Mississippi State, but first a word from our sponsors. Want to enjoy your life again? Burning, numbness, and general pain in your feet and legs might be keeping you from your daily activities. Neuropathy treatment can be effective to restoring your life. Come see what we can do at Enhanced Healthcare Wellness Institute in Uptown Rogers. We can treat your neuropathy pain and get you back in the game of life. Enhanced Healthcare Wellness Institute is located at 5102 West Pauline Whitaker Parkway in Uptown Rogers. At Kendall King, we're proud of over four decades of design. We're continuing the legacy of great creative design by combining our brands of Kendall King, Soapbox, and Shopcart. Together, these brands represent a new focus in marketing design with individual attention to specific areas. Through our design expertise supported by a team of talented professionals, we showcase our best. We are Kendall King. We are Soapbox. We are Shopcart. We are Design. Hey, welcome back. I want to tell you about our friends at Enhanced Healthcare Wellness Institute. They are your source for holistic wellness and your healthy lifestyle changes Located in Uptown Rogers, the staff at Enhanced Healthcare will target your specific health plan for wellness from neuropathy treatment, primary care, weight loss, and so much more. You can count on the experts at Enhanced Healthcare Wellness Institute in Rogers. Our thanks to Greg Gurley from the uh, KU Basketball Network for being with us. Uh, th- there's a lot of excitement, I think, about this game. And it's, it's weird because it doesn't even count. 
I know. It, it's funny how that how that tends to go. I mean, saw it last season with the Purdue exhibition, and, mm-hmm. you know, that's how it is when you schedule these these big games that don't count. But it's also, you know, it's I think people are so excited, especially, you know, first look at this team, things mm-hmm. like that. So I think no matter who you put them against, obviously it's there's it's leveled up because it's Kansas, but anybody you put out there, people would be pretty excited. It was interesting talking to him because off the off the air, because, you know, Kansas, they play in like, the biggest events. They go to Madison Square Garden. They are in the Final Four. They are, you know, obviously uh, at the Champions Classic. They go to, you know, they, they play cool home and home events. He was talking about how excited he is to be at Bud Walton Arena and experience a sold out crowd. Yeah, he said he's never been to Fayetteville, which is pretty cool. Um, I always think it's fun when people get to experience our, our corner of the world for the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, seeing a sold out Bud Walton, that'll be cool for, for anybody that's into college basketball. What did Calipari call it the other day? He said this postage stamp of the world yeah. is a great <laughs> hidden secret or something yeah, like that. Yeah, well, that's, I, I feel like he's going to drop things like that, lines like that throughout the, <laughs> the year. Calipari has the ability to, like, like we all know that Bud Walton Arena is a great venue for basketball. I don't know that everybody knows that on a national yeah. scale. And I feel like the type of games, and I know they don't really have any big games here this year, but over time, you know, whether it be non-conference games or maybe it's when Alabama comes in or maybe you have a, an SEC upstart that comes in and it's a, a real high-profile game, I feel like his – being on the sideline is going to elevate the profile of that arena uh, maybe more to the level that it was 30 years ago when it opened. Yeah, it's like we were talking about yesterday. You know, when, how long does it take maybe for that to kind of come through? When, basically, when do people start looking at Arkansas the way that they looked at a Kentucky or whatever, you know, um, with when does that influence start to really show itself? It already has in a lot of ways. And I'll be curious, you know, as the season goes on, how that continues to manifest and how people around the country people who just follow college basketball continue to sort of recognize Arkansas obviously different coaching styles but I feel like Kansas is what Arkansas and Calipari is going to strive to achieve that that type of program I mean you you look at the schedule Arkansas their schedule is a ton of non-conference games out of state at neutral sites Kansas is here I was looking at their con their their, uh, their schedule Michigan State in Atlanta. I think that might be the Champions Classic. They play Duke in Las Vegas this year. They go to Creighton. They go to Missouri. They play NC State in uh, in Allen Fieldhouse. They play a challenging schedule. I think you're going to see that from Arkansas down the road. Yeah, that's what it looks like. I mean, even now, just looking at Calipari's first schedule, I think that's something that's important to him. And especially, you know, even events like this, like we said, that don't count, you know, he, he wants to get some difficult tests on the schedule and kind of build this team that way. Uh, we're, uh, uh, we'll have something on Friday morning. John Calipari and Bill Self and members of the teams, uh, both Arkansas and Kansas teams, are actually going to be at Springdale High School for a mental health pep rally. It's part of the, uh, not, it's part of the nonprofit, uh, the charitable aspect to this game that allows them to have the game in the first place. And so that'll be very interesting to hear them talk uh, on Friday morning uh, before they play. Turning the page now to Mississippi State. It's an 11:45 kickoff on Saturday on SEC Network. Jeff Lebby spoke earlier this week, the Mississippi State coach, about playing Arkansas, and this is what he had to say. Uh, you know, when you when you watch Arkansas, Pitt's done an unbelievable job of getting those guys uh, to find a way to win close games. Um, as he's been there, that that's what they're doing right now. You know, last week for them didn't go obviously the same as it had weeks before, but finding a way to beat Tennessee at home, finding a way to beat Auburn in a really close game. And so that's where they, to me, have made, you know, really, really big strides. Uh, You see a physical football team that plays with a ton of effort. Uh, It is all over the tape and it's in all three phases. So, uh, again, it's another really good SEC opponent. Uh, They've won two SEC games and they'll be coming in here Saturday morning. We'll have to go take victory. It is interesting to me to hear another coach talk about Arkansas taking strides, winning close games. He would know. I mean, he was at Ole Miss. He was their offensive coordinator when Arkansas couldn't close it out in uh, 2021. Of course, you know, a two-point conversion, that could go either way, kind of a toss-up type play. Kendall Bryles is his brother-in-law. I'm sure he's kept up with Arkansas under Pittman uh, probably better than he has a lot of SEC programs. But it's, it's just interesting uh, to, to hear him talk about Arkansas taking strides toward 
winning close games. We talked about it. Auburn was closer than maybe people realize. It wasn't a one-score game, but it was a close game. Uh, UAB shouldn't have been a close game, but it was. Arkansas found a way to win that. So they have taken strides in that area this year. They didn't get a chance to win a close game against LSU the other night. Right. It's it's funny because I feel like one of the complaints that we hear from fans a lot about Sam Pittman is not being able to win close games uh, because their losses have been close, um, with the exception of LSU. But um, you know, but that's kind of what happens when you play close games. You win some, you lose some. So obviously, you know, that's kind of how it shakes out. But yeah, I mean, I think when you compare it maybe to last year, especially, you know, the the ability to close out games, I think, has improved. Um, and and some of that, you know, the close games go both go two different ways, right? You're either you might be blowing a lead and trying to save it, or you might be making a comeback. And Arkansas has done both this year. So, um, yeah, I think it is interesting. I it, it's always interesting to see what coaches pull out as when they're complimenting you know mm-hmm. the other coach what they pull out and what they say um so yeah it's it's interesting that he highlighted that because like you said he's pretty familiar with arkansas also yep. i always forget mississippi state's an adidas school oh I forget that every time i just saw the adidas on his jacket and i was like man i forget that's a thing <laughs> i remember when i see their ugly baseball jersey adidas, <laughs> ha- adidas puts out the absolute worst baseball jerseys on a year in and year out basis. Yeah, they're not. Are they the ones with the camo, or that's, or is that Missouri State? No. Well, I mean, Missouri State is an Adidas school. Yeah, they've got the camo. Like, I mean, they the come out with some hideous stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Miami is an Adidas school, I think. Oh. Uh, in fact, I know they are because Cam Ward just signed a, a contract yes. with Adidas. Yeah. And uh, Louisville, they're an Adidas school. Uh, I think Texas A and M might be, or at least they were. Uh, and so, yeah. But Mississippi yeah. State, boy, their yeah. baseball jerseys. Ooh. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> I feel like having uh, uh, you've got me all <laughs> I'm talking, thinking, talking about Adidas now. The uh, the quarterback play I feel like can play a factor in close games, and it's where I feel like Arkansas might have a, an upper hand this week having Taylor Green uh, over a true freshman Michael Van Buren, who he's played in some close games. You know, last week against Texas A and M, that was a close game. Georgia eh, maybe kind of close. Uh, like I've said, I said, I don't think it was as close as the final score indicated. But uh, you, you gotta like Arkansas's quarterback matchup in this game, at least as it comes to you know potentially being a, a close game at the end. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, it goes back to what we talked about a lot at the beginning of the season when Arkansas was playing. It felt like a, a young quarterback every week for the first you know month plus of the season, um, where you know how you know experience does matter a lot. How much it depends. Um, I think with Van Buren, I think what you see with a lot of freshman quarterbacks especially is the the more they're playing and the more tape opponents get on them kind of you you might get a guy that comes in a backup that comes in as a freshman or a redshirt freshman and makes a big splash and it's because nobody knows anything about him yet and then the more teams start to figure him out some of the shine wears off and you know I think we saw that happen with Marcel Reed at Texas A&M and Mm -hmm. um, you know it happens a lot and so I'll be curious how Arkansas, you know, what they learn about Van Buren and how they sort of attack him. But I think he is very promising as a as a freshman quarterback. But yeah, I do think Arkansas should have the advantage there, just an experience factor and things like that. I mean, his numbers the last couple of weeks against Georgia and, and Texas A and M have been really good. Three touchdowns, one interception uh, in both games. Uh, this is what Jeff Levy had to say about Texas A or about Mississippi State being on a six-game losing streak, but being an improving team? I think, I feel, and our guys inside the, the building feel every single day, it is an incredibly fine line to where we have a chance to have a happy locker room if there's two things that are different inside the game. It is that that close. And so uh, us understanding that, our preparation, dialing into that piece of it, out preparing our opponent starting today, uh, and finding a way to to make that jump. There has been great improvement. We've gotten better, but we need to get better and we need to win. Uh, and that's uh, that, that's what we're fighting to go do. Just a 12-minute press conference, by the way, for him previewing really? Arkansas. It, it, every time I watch these opposing uh, head coaches, I think about how much shorter their press conferences are uh, than what Sam Pittman does at yeah. Arkansas. Is it not a lot was of questions? Like 10. Yeah. I don't know if it's not a lot of questions. or Heifel's a short answer guy. Is he a short – is Levy a short answer guy? Uh, no, I mean, that was about yeah. standard answer, yeah. you know, 30, 40 seconds, somewhere okay. in there. Yeah, he's not he's not quite as succinct and to the point as Josh Heifel was. But anyway, as I was listening to the full 12 minutes of his press conference, uh, you can just feel the, the stress that he is under on this six-game losing streak. I mean, it's like you can almost see it in his eyes. You can hear it in his voice. Uh, I feel like there's probably not a harder job 
in uh, in the SEC than being a first year football coach who is struggling. Well, and especially now because you don't get as much of a buffer with the portal. You're expected to bring in a bunch of guys mm-hmm. from your old team, possibly, or or you know, you're you're expected to hit the ground running more. I think now than you used to be. It used to be. Um, you know, you get a buffer, you got to get your guys in and you got to establish your culture. And now it's like, you're expected to, everything's supposed to be a fast fix. So, I mean, I'd be interested to hear, you know, what Mississippi state fans, how they feel about this year one. I don't know, you know, what were their expectations coming in for him? You know, I think people were excited about the hire, but what did they think, you know, win total wise, what did they think was going to happen? Um, I'm sure they didn't expect as few as they've gotten, but you know, I'd be curious what, what the expectation was and and what they see because from the outside it it seems like I think he's right I don't think that's just him trying to spin it they have improved offensively um they're doing better they're putting out better performances here in the last few weeks against teams we expected to just kind of roll over them um I think the defense which we touched on yesterday is the bigger concern because it hasn't it doesn't seem to have improved at all. It's been at the bottom and it remains at the bottom and they haven't really competed that way. So I think that's something that I'm sure is very front of mind for them. And, you know, Arkansas needs to take advantage of a defense that seems to be not great. So you're going to Starkville. Yes. Have you been? I have. I was there in 2021, 2022. 2022. Yeah. So I was there. The Hornsby game. Yes. Yes. Actually, they start, who, do, who do they start? They started, um, Cade Fortin. Yes. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. They started him and then they brought Hornsby in off the bench. Yeah. Hornsby, Arkansas State wide receiver star, Malik Hornsby. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I've been before not staying in Starkville, did not stay in Starkville the last time. I don't know where one stays in Starkville. (laughs) So, I've kind of been out of town. You've got to get a hotel reservation about a year in advance for a football game because there's just no hotels there. Yeah. So, been staying outside. But, yeah, I've been before. I, it was fine. South any, Haven, that's yeah. the place to stay. I got you. I'm or going, Olive Branch. I'm going Tupelo. Okay. Because yeah. it's on the way. And, yeah, you know, it's sort of on the way. It yeah. depends on which way you go, but yeah, yeah. I can kind of see that. Yeah, that's where I'm you going. You got your earplugs packed? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got them in them. my backpack? Yeah. I would be fine if I never had to go to another football game in Starkville. Yeah. Which I haven't been there in a while. Yeah. Uh, oh. Do the fans like it? I mean, they have to like it if they do it, but I'm like, there's got to be some Mississippi State fans that are like, this hurts me. Yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> it's... It's something. I wonder how many of them have earplugs in. I know. Yeah, probably not many. I feel like they're. I feel like they're tough. It's one of those sneaky tough places to play yeah. because of the cowbells. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. It's. I. I don't remember if the press box is open or not. I no, it say is. It is. Oh, okay. it's open. I was yes. like, I couldn't remember. I don't remember. Last year, maybe I just wore earplugs, but or last time I was there, but I, I don't remember leaving being like that was impossible, like a, an impossible environment to work in. I remember mm. it being like better than expected. I don't remember why, but we'll see. I'll be interested how it how it goes this time. It is it bull. <laughs> better you than me going to Starkville. <laughs> I'll tell you that. All right, when we come back. We got a lot more to get to, but first another word from our sponsors. Want to enjoy your life again? Burning numbness and general pain in your feet and legs might be keeping you from your daily activities. Neuropathy treatment can be effective to restoring your life. Come see what we can do at Enhanced Healthcare Wellness Institute in Uptown Rogers. We can treat your neuropathy pain and get you back in the game of life. Enhanced Healthcare Wellness Institute is located at 5102 West Pauline Whitaker Parkway in Uptown Rogers. At Kendall King, we're proud of over four decades of design. We're continuing the legacy of great creative design by combining our brands of Kendall King, Soapbox, and Shopcart. Together, these brands represent a new focus in marketing design with individual attention to specific areas. Through our design expertise supported by a team of talented professionals, we showcase our best. We are Kindle King. We are Soapbox. We are Shopcart. We are Design. Welcome back. I want to tell you about our friends at Bentonville Glass. They have been serving their community since 1971. They are committed, professional, and versatile. If you're looking for a quality leader in Northwest Arkansas or looking for skilled craftsmanship, look no further than Bentonville Glass for all your glass market needs with the highest quality products. You can come by and see them now at 507 South Main in Bentonville or online at bentonvilleglass.com. And if you're from Mississippi State you're watching this, I have nothing against Starkville. It's the Cowbells. It's the noise that the cowbells make in the I stadium. I think they'd be proud of that. I think they'd be proud that the cowbells bother opposing beat writers. I think I, they would. I, I'm sure they would. <laughs> but, man, it, I, 
it it's it is a hard I don't know maybe it maybe it depends on the person and like how you adjust to sound yeah if you can tune stuff like, out and I feel like the older I get this is the old man coming out but like the older I get the more sound bothers me yeah I don't think I can handle it very well I've I've always been ve- I'm like very sensitive to like sudden loud noise or yes. things like that like yeah I've always it, been like I get I get angry <laughs> I've got an idea. Okay, you know those little bells that a cat wears around its neck to <laughs> yeah. scare the birds away? Maybe they could transition to that. Replace like, them with that. Not get rid of the bells entirely, but just downsize. Just a little jingle <laughs> bell. <laughs> I mean, have you been there, Blake? A uh, long time, about twelve years ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean it's the John L. Smith season. Well, that you, yeah, I bet they were ringing that day. Um, <laughs> you know, it all kind of depends on like what kind of team they have, how how like loud and you know just uncomfortable it is it feels like uh during the years when i was going there a lot they were pretty good uh 2010 they had a good team with dan mullen that was a double overtime game uh 2014 we went down there uh the week that they were number one in the first college football playoff poll and they had dak prescott uh so you know there, there were some years there where i can really remember you know the cowbells really ringing uh but uh yeah it's it's i'm sure they love it it's a great home field advantage. It's just not one of my favorite places to visit. <laughs> yeah. If you're sensitive to sound, it's tough. Yeah, I'm sensitive to a lot. You can <laughs> uh, get the latest breaking news on all of our Razorback sports at wholehogsports.com. You can read all of Christina's content from Starkville this weekend. Uh, we think it's the most in-depth source for Arkansas sports. Analysis, latest in recruiting from Richard Davenport. Uh, unique stories on all your favorite teams. Subscribe today at wholehogsports.com. Did you see that Kenny Hamlin is going to be Arkansas's SEC football legend. That was announced yesterday. Uh, he'll be recognized at the SEC championship game in December. Uh, nice timing because Ken was on the field before the game the other night against LSU was uh, was recognized. But what stood out to me is that you've got four schools who have SEC legends this year who did not play in the SEC. you got Barry Switzer at Oklahoma. Let me, see, let me pull up the list. Barry Switzer at Oklahoma. You've got uh, <clears throat> Vince Young from Texas, Chase Daniel from Missouri, and then South Carolina's got a, an older player, Corey Miller, who played there before the Gamecocks joined the SEC. They were an independent whenever he played in the 80s and the early 90s. Something about that just is, is a little weird to me. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely weird. Mm-hmm. I wonder how those guys feel. I mean, I'm sure, you know, any honor you get is is good, and I obviously <clears throat> can't speak for them, but I just – I kind of wonder if any of them scratch their heads and go like, okay, I guess, you know, because it's, yeah, you didn't play in the SEC and, you know, I get it. They want to include all the schools and, and everything, but I kind of feel odd. like it should be, you got to wait a little bit till you've got some guys that have played in the yeah, SEC. Yeah, the, they, they open themselves up to some criticism for this. Even uh, uh, Texas A&M's um, uh, honoree this year, Luke Jockel, he only played one year in the SEC, most of his career with the Aggies. Uh, was as a Big 12 team, but at least he did play in the league. And, and we see this from Arkansas, too, where, you know, they Marvin Delf is an SEC basketball legend. No, he's not. I mean, he, he played in the Southwest Conference. Uh, I don't know. It's just kind of strange to me seeing all these old – Barry Switzer has had nothing to do with the SEC. Vince Young had nothing to do with the SEC. Yeah. Chase Daniel. It, it, I don't know. It's just, it's just kind of odd to me. Yeah, it's always funny watching how that kind of claiming game goes with conferences, with teams. You know, like when Arkansas. I, I think the basketball account has tweeted about some of Calipari's like former guys. Well, we're getting that are in to the that. NBA. Trust yeah. me, we're getting <laughs> yeah. to that. You know, and it's like I get it. They gotta promote their stuff, but it's kind of funny and like it invites people to clown on you and be like, you don't get to claim him. You know, um, so Here's it's, it's always kind of funny to watch how that goes. Jalen Hurts is he an SEC legend for Alabama or for Oklahoma now? I don't know. <laughs> they put, they'll put both. They'll put a slash. I guess. <laughs> they'll do like half one of the logos and half the other. It's going to be interesting. And, and we've heard Hunter Yurchek talk about this with the, the U of A uh, Hall of Honor. Is in the future how some of these uh, distinctions are made. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because it's like you're going to be fortunate to have a whole lot of players who stay anywhere for more than a couple of years. And anyway, it's just it, – it, and. It's interesting how the distinction is going to be made because it is such a different world in college sports now. Yeah, it's it's interesting to figure out how who gets to claim what. And, you know, this is obviously a much smaller scale, but when we were putting together the Olympics issue of Hogs Illustrated, there were a couple oh, athletes like 10 of them. Yeah, that had transferred. And so I ended up doing – I decided to just make the parameter athletes that finished their careers at Arkansas. 
but they had so many that they claimed for track and field because like a, a Tara Davis Woodall who right. competed at Texas, but she trains in Fayetteville. Right. So she's kind of like part of their their extended track family, right. but she never competed so for Razorbacks. So I didn't put her in, because I was like, I, I did a list Ryan of Razorbacks. Ryan another one. And like, she wasn't a Razorback. She's amazing and great, and it's really cool that she trains here. But I was like, she, if I'm doing former Razorbacks, she was never a Razorback, so I'm not going to put her on the list of former Razorbacks. So that's kind of what I did. And then I set the, for, tra- there was a couple athletes that had transferred, so I ended up doing, yeah, athletes that finished their careers at Arkansas. Because they also had some that transferred in, and so mm-hmm. I ended up just doing it that way. And it's it's interesting how you have to set those parameters now and be really, you know, think very hard about a, who gets to claim what a lot of people don't think about that they mm-hmm. just say hey you know we've got 30 pro hogs competing in paris mm-hmm. yeah they're not all you know they're, they're not all they razorbacks hogs. yeah even <laughs> if they've got an affiliation with the program it, it's just kind of interesting yeah. uh, how that works bowl projections uh, are out this week it was kind of interesting looking at some of these cbs sports they've got arkansas playing illinois at the music city bowl Brett Bielema's got a 6-1 and team after they beat Michigan the other day. They out-Michigan Michigan. Michigan. Yeah, it was crazy. Did you see the black and white newsreel? Yes, that that I sent you. Yeah, that was cool. I wish it weren't such an obviously AI voice. Like, the voice could have been, they could have done such a much better, like, old-timey newscaster voice. Mm -hmm. The footage looked awesome. The voice was, like. And the script was very, like, 1930s newsreel. But then it was being read with this, like, bad AI voice that I thought, you know, I had notes for the (laughs) the two-minute Twitter video. (laughs) Illinois wore those uh, 1920s throwback uniforms to beat Michigan the other day. So CBS has Arkansas playing Illinois at the Music City Bowl. Uh, Texas Bowl is uh, projected by Athlon Sports against Texas Tech. Uh, there's a couple of others, including Action Network, who Brett McMurphy works for. Uh, they've, they've also got that uh, that prediction. Uh, 24-7 Sports has Arkansas West Virginia at the Liberty Bowl. And the College Football Network is projecting Arkansas to play Duke at the Birmingham Bowl. USA Today projecting Arkansas to play Georgia Tech at the Birmingham Bowl. Yeah, Texas Bowl feels... Do any of those bowl games just, like, they they excite you? The Texas Bowl is kind of fun, I guess. Uh, Maybe. I, you know, I don't know. I've been to all of those, except I haven't been to Birmingham Bowl. I've never been that interested in going to the Birmingham Bowl. Mm -hmm. And I've never been to Music City, I don't think. But I've been to the Liberty Bowl, and I've been to the Texas Bowl. I've been to the Music City. They played Minnesota there in 2002. Uh... Same stadium. I'm sure maybe they've that that was early on in the bowl experience. So I'm, I'm sure maybe they have they've improved it. Um, don't remember a whole lot to write home about that one though. Uh, the Texas Bowl. It's nice in that it's indoors, and obviously the Texans have got a. Uh, I mean, you're you're in the Texans NFL stadium there, so yeah. uh, that's nice. Liberty Bowl. Yeah, I mean, kind of been there, done that. Yeah. Birmingham Bowl. Uh, it's not a a, a a. It's certainly not a. Um, an attractive bowl. It's one of the it's one of those that the SEC teams go to once everybody else has kind of filled their yeah you know they've 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 made their selections. I will say this for Birmingham: it's not at Legion Field anymore. They've built a new stadium downtown. Uh, that's not real big, but it it is nice. Yeah, the Birmingham Bowl is the one with the trophy, right? That has the the big butt. <laughs> I have no it idea. It is. You gotta look this up. The Birmingham Bowl trophy is like it's a guy. It's a man. <laughs> Um, and he has a crazy behind and it, it gets, it makes the rounds on the internet every year around the Birmingham bowl. Yes. I'm sure uh, the podcast can't see it, but I'm showing. We'll have, we'll have picture. Blake put a picture up so we can see it's, this. Can you turn really, your computer yeah, to your here, camera? It's not very big. Uh, it's not a very large, not photo, a very big, butt. but it's the butt is big. The picture <laughs> is not it's see it's, I got like a Google result. It's, it's not very big, but you got to. You've got to look it up. It's very funny. So anyway, there's at least that. We were talking about trophies last week. This is a great one. <laughs> so that'll be in the case whenever you walk right into the Smith Center. The yes, big, exactly. The big yeah, you just make sure you go around the back when you look at it. <laughs> okay. Maybe they'll just turn it around. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No. But anyway, you know, I mean, I'm I've just gotten so out on bowl games. They they don't matter anymore. Well, they don't, and and nobody cares about them. Nobody cares about them. Nobody plays at them. Yeah, you know everybody's everybody's you know you've got some that are going pro. Eh, I'm not going to play. I don't want to get hurt. You got others who you know they're done with the program. They're they're going to hit the transfer portal, um, and I don't feel like the fans really care about them as much anymore because, look, bowl games used to be fun. They would be a way for you to go spend you know three days, seven days, whatever, in, in kind of a cool location sometimes, and you know celebrate your team and you knew you were going to have a, a a good product on the field. 
at the end of those seven days, you don't know what you're going to have now in the bowl game. Yeah, it's I just, mean, because you just don't know who's going to play. Right, and then even if you have, you know, such and such for, true freshman has a great game, you can't even read it that much into it because he might have had a great game against all the threes from the opposing team because their whole team left. You know, like it's just – I just – I don't – I don't get excited about bowl games anymore, but it feels like it feels like we haven't adjusted how we talk about them enough yet. We adjust how we talk about them after they happen, but as far as like when we're t- talking about bowl projections, I feel like we haven't I don't know, I don't feel like the conversation about bowl games leading into them has gone the direction has reflected what bowl games are now. Until you get to the point where okay, who's actually going to play? If you've got a young team, bowl games can be fun. A young team full of players who you feel good about their coming back, you know, so like whenever um well, whenever Arkansas went to the Outback Bowl against Penn State, or you know, even Arkansas and KU when they played at the Liberty Bowl, they both had you know some, you know, both of their quarterbacks were were coming back, and so that made a difference. It you know it helped improve the quality of the game, but too often it's not that way. Hey, Arkansas has got to get bowl eligible. By the way, they're only at four wins. They've got to win. Um, you think they're going to beat Louisiana Tech down the road, uh, but they've got to find another SEC win. And it feels like they need to do that against Mississippi State because if they don't beat Mississippi State, you got to beat Ole Miss, you got to beat Texas, or you got to beat Missouri. Yeah, it gets a lot harder um, after this weekend. This is uh, NBA opening day, or I guess technically yesterday was NBA opening day with a couple of games uh, last night. But there are eleven Razorbacks who are on opening day NBA rosters: Jalen Williams and Isaiah Joe with the Thunder; Moses Moody, who just got a big new contract with the Golden State Warriors. Uh, Bobby Portis back in Milwaukee. Daniel Gafford is in Dallas. Anthony Black is with the Magic. Nick Smith with the Hornets. Ricky Council with the Sixers. Uh, Jordan Walsh is uh, with the Celtics. And then there's a couple of players on two-way contracts. Mason Jones with the Kings. Stanley Amude with the Bucks. Arkansas, I thought I saw this yesterday, is tied for fifth among college programs with players on NBA rosters, including the ones on two-way contracts. Wow, that's big. I, I didn't realize Amude was with the Bucks. now. I It's fun seeing him succeed. I always liked him when he was here. And same with Council. I liked him a lot. So Do you think South Dakota claims him? Yeah, maybe. I bet. I bet they Probably do. Probably so. Um, yeah, they sh- I mean, maybe they should. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, are you an NBA guy? Do you have an NBA team? Um, I, I play didn't... 2K with my son sometimes. Okay, I but gotcha. that's the, I, I do like watching the NBA playoffs. I've never really gotten into watching a whole lot of regular season. If there's nothing going on on a Friday night and TNT might have a, a like a, a cool matchup, uh, I'll watch that. But I'm not, not like some super NBA fan. I'll tell you what I hate is that early season, uh, what do they call it, the in-season tournament? Oh yeah. When they have floors that are just oh yeah, I just so about awful that. on the eyes. Yes. Oh yeah. my lord, <laughs> I can't watch it. I just I tried watching last year. There was a game between the Nuggets and somebody in Denver, and they've got this blue floor, and you can barely see the players on it. I, yeah. I mean, I'm not I'm not doing that. Uh, I'm getting grumpy <laughs> in my age. Kentucky number one in uh, NBA players on uh, or players on NBA rosters 29. So. John Calipari obviously uh, touting that yesterday. Duke is second with 24, UCLA third with 14, uh, Arizona fourth with 12, Arkansas tied with Kansas, Gonzaga, and Southern Cal, which is kind of interesting because, you know, uh, Eric Musselman is at Southern Cal. I went on USC's website this morning just to see if USC did a uh, kind of a combo Muss and former USC Mm -hmm. players in the NBA. Nothing to be found. Interesting. Did Arkansas do a combo Kentucky? Oh, yes, they did. Okay, that's what I thought. They did, yeah. It's, it's, because if you're Arkansas and you're you know, their publicist now, you are you are as much promoting Calipari and his past as you are Arkansas's yeah. past. It's just yeah. kind of, I did see that USC beat UTSA in an exhibition oh, game. Yeah, and they're going to play Gonzaga this weekend. Oh, that's so big. another you know another high profile like we were talking with Greg about at the start of the show. Another one of these high-profile early season exhibition games. I like these. Yeah, I, I like watching them. I, I had, I can't tell you how much fun I had last year watching Arkansas Purdue, and then the next day just kind of sitting around because the Big Ten Network had a doubleheader. They had KU and Illinois, and then they had Tennessee and Michigan State. And I think on that same day, Texas A and M and Texas Tech played an exhibition oh, against each other. Wow. So the qual it's, it's not just that they're getting played. The quality, the quality of these is improving too. Yeah, I mean, it's always fun. I think when people have been so hungry for college basketball for so long, when you can get those, even when, like we said at the top of the show, it doesn't matter. You know, it's still very, it's still exciting, and it's exciting to see to start to learn about some of these teams against each other. And yeah, I'll be interested how 
Southern Cal looks against Gonzaga because I don't know it, th- what the expectation for Southern Cal isn't super high this year, is it? I don't. I don't. Think. I don't think so. Yeah. So I think Musselman's kind of gone into irrelevance. Not that he is irrelevant, but that he is like his his program this year on the national scale is is not really relevant. Right. People aren't talking about it. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's exactly what's happened. Yeah. Uh, we will have Peyton Hillis, an interview with him on our podcast tomorrow. He's going to be our speaker at the Hogs Illustrated Sports Club, uh, so hope you'll be back for that. We won't see Christina for the rest of the week. You got a prediction for Arkansas-Mississippi State before you get out of here? I think Arkansas wins. I haven't written it up yet, but I think – I don't have a score, but I think uh, I think it's an Arkansas win. It should – I think it should be. I think, I think they need to win. if it's not, it's, it's a problem. Yep, I, I, I agree with that. You know, it's Mississippi State defensively just – not real good. Arkansas, if you're going to be considered a <clears> – <throat> I don't know what the word would be, but if you're going to be considered kind of legitimate in the SEC, I think you got to win this. Yeah. You, you cannot afford to lose this game. Yeah. I mean, it, like we talked about with bowl eligibility, it just gets so much harder if you lose this one. Arkansas and Mississippi State on Saturday. We'll continue looking forward to that throughout the week. Christina, have fun in Starkville. Thanks. Come to our website, wholehogsports.com, to read our coverage leading up to the game. And uh, we'll be back with another podcast tomorrow. Hope to see you then. Have a great day, everyone.